Hey guys, welcome back to Fix It Friday. So first off, I just want to wish all of you guys a happy new year and I hope you had a good holiday. I certainly did. I have been working really hard for the last, I don't know, six or seven months and I needed a break. So I took a break from making videos. I took some time off and now I totally feel refreshed and I'm ready to get back to work modding consoles and repairing them and showing you guys how I do it. So we're going to start the new year right with the Nintendo Entertainment System. And so today what we're going to be doing is installing Tim Worthington's NES RGB. This is something that I've shown before on the channel, but what I'm going to do today is I'm going to combine it with this nice little 3D printed component here. This is made by um, Laser Bear Tech, and what it is is basically a Super Nintendo multi-out port that you can easily install into an NES, and you can see that the color is fairly closely matched to the original plastic. And so this lets you use um, SNES SCART cables, or you could even use SNES Composite or S-Video. Uh, you could also use HD Retrovision cables. So that's the nice thing about this, is that it gives you a lot of versatility once you do this modification. Um, aside from that, I'll also add uh, expansion audio to this console so that if you use Japanese games um, that have the extra sound channels, you'll hear them. And I'll walk you through the whole process step by step. All right, guys, so let's get to it. All right, so I'm going to get started with disassembling this console. And the Nintendo is one of the easiest systems to take apart. All you need is a Phillips screwdriver like this. And all of the screws are the exact same size with the exception of two that are right over here um, that hold the cartridge tray in place. And so as long as you just remember that, it's really, really easy. So I'm going to go ahead and get the board out and let's have a closer look. Okay, so with this mod, you start right away with the most difficult thing, and that is the removal of this chip right here. This is known as the PPU, or the Picture Processing Unit, so it's the main graphics chip on the NES. So this is a 40-pin dual inline package chip, or a DIP chip, and removing these uh, is tricky. It's not for the faint of heart. So what I do to remove these is I follow it with three steps. The first thing is I take all of these points here and I add fresh solder to all of them. This just helps everything to flow more easily and um, makes it easier to clear out all of these little vias. And then once that's done, I come in with my Hako desoldering gun and I uh, desolder all of these points. And that usually gets rid of all or most of the, uh, the solder in that area. And then finally, I'll follow up by taking a hot air gun and um, just passing it over this region here, while at the same time I take like a, a small uh, flathead screwdriver and I just put very, very gentle pressure on the chip. And that helps to just remove the last little pieces of solder that might be still in these vias holding the chip in place. And I found that with that method, you have a very high rate of success. Um, the thing that usually messes people up with this is that they use a lot of force or they don't, you know, desolder this properly. And then, and then they end up pulling traces and destroying the NES motherboard. And so that's obviously something we want to avoid. But I found with following those three steps that you have a very high rate of success. All right, so let's get started with that. Alright, so now the PPU chip has been removed and I just wanted to show you how everything looks before I continue. So you can see that all the vias are cleared and there's absolutely no damage whatsoever to the board. Just flip it over and show you the same thing on this side. And here's the chip and so you can see it comes out you know, very easily without any effort. So you can see that none of the pins have excess solder on them and they all came out nice and straight. And so yeah, that's why I really recommend this three-step approach to removing chips. It always produces a really good result. All right, so now that that's all set, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be installing this precision pin socket over here in place of where the PPU used to be. So this is going to go right in like that. And I also need to get some components out of the way because the... Um, the NES RGB is basically going to sit like, like this, and so these capacitors, for example, they're too tall, they're in the way, so uh, I have to 
flatten these ceramics down, which I've already done. And I'm gonna, you know, loosen these guys up and bend them so that they lay flush with the board. And so that will allow me to install this nice and straight. Okay, so you can see that the precision socket has now been installed and uh, hopefully it's clear on camera, but this notch here lines up with the notch on the silk screen of the board. So just make sure that you do that when you install it in place. And if you saw in the video, I start by just soldering the four corners in and then pushing on the, on the socket just to make sure everything is flush. And once I'm certain that everything is flush, then I go ahead and I solder in the remaining pins. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna just add in this double-sided header and I've already done it on one side. I'm gonna go ahead and put it in here. And once this is into the socket, we're gonna go ahead and install the NES RGB on top and then solder it into place. And so you can see here these silk screened lines. So those are the rows that we're going to be attaching um, the NES RGB to. So this other set of rows is gonna be for the actual PPU itself. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the PPU and we're gonna install it into this set of vias over here. Um, you'll notice though that when I just place it in that it's very seriously crooked over to the side. The reason why is that these pins here are a little bit too high. Um, and some of you might be asking yourselves, well, why don't you just install a socket? And of course you certainly can with other versions of the Nintendo Entertainment System. But with the front loader, if you add in a socket, this whole thing becomes too tall and the Nintendo actually will no longer fit inside of the shell. So for the front loader only, you kind of have to solder the chip directly to the NES RGB. Not a big deal. But before we do any of that, we've got to make sure that these are pretty flush. So I'm going to go ahead and I have a set of flush cutters right here, and I'm going to snip all of these pins. All right, so now I've got the PPU inside of all of the vias that we're gonna be soldering to. You'll see that there's a notch over here at the top and that matches the notch on the silk screen. So definitely make sure you get that done correctly. And um, if you look at it kind of from this, like, I don't know if it's gonna come in focus, but it's a little bit crooked still, but it's way, way better now than it was um, before I made that, you know, cutting of all of those pins. So now it's pretty much right in place. And so we're gonna just flip it upside down and just like every other step here, we're gonna solder the four corners, make sure it's all aligned properly, and, uh, and then solder in the rest of the vias. Okay, so the last two things we need to do to the actual board itself is we have to solder in two jumpers. So this jumper over here needs to be closed, J3, and this is for power. So we're gonna use power from the NES itself. They send you a adapter board for power, but um, personally I've never found the use for it and I think others have shown that it's unnecessary. And uh, we're also gonna close this jumper over here for J5. This is because this is a North American console, an NTSC. So for Japanese consoles and North American consoles, you've gotta close this jumper. If you're doing this on a European console though, you leave this open. All right, so now let's go ahead and start wiring in the audio. Okay, so to start with sound, we're gonna solder a single wire to 
the NES RGB board, and this is going to be for expansion audio. So, so you'll see that there is a tiny little via right over here, right next to this J5 jumper that we um, closed up earlier. So I'm going to take this very long wire, I think this is at least 12 inches long or so, and we're just going to slide that through and solder it in place. So this is where expansion audio comes into the board and then it gets mixed in with all the regular audio. Okay, so I've taken the NES RGB board and put it into the socket and you can see I have this expansion audio cable right over here. I have it running between these two ceramic capacitors and just kind of tucking into the underside of the board. I'm gonna leave that alone for now. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna wire in the regular audio and so you can do that right over here on the two top legs of these two resistors here, R3 and R4. So this one over here, R4, we're gonna wire it up to pad A, right over here. And then R3, we're gonna wire up to pad B. All right, so now we're on the underside of the board and we've got this wire from the expansion audio and we're gonna finish that up right over here. So this area right here is the expansion port on the NES. And this was never used for anything um, during the lifespan of the NES, but with a very simple modification, you can add expansion audio to the NES. And that means that if you're using an EverDrive or an original cartridge of games like Castlevania III from Japan, uh, those games have extra sound channels, and with this modification, you can hear those extra sound channels, and it makes a really big difference on some games. So, all we need here is two resistors. So we've got a 1K resistor here, and a 47K resistor here. So, we're going to take this 1K resistor, and we're going to solder it between pins 2 and 9 over here. So there's 1K across those two pins. And then we're going to come in with this expansion audio wire and I'm going to solder it to one end of the 47k resistor and then the other end is going to go to pin 9 over here. So that's it. It's really not that difficult um, and I have some insulation here just so that when I make the connection between the 47k and the wire everything's all isolated and it doesn't make contact with anything else. All right so let's go ahead and do this. Okay, so now we're at the stage where we need to set aside the NES RGB and we need to make a port for this Super Nintendo multi-out over here. <clears throat> so to do that, LaserBear provides this little jig over here and you can see that it it's it's designed so that it has these like two ridges on one side and a single ridge on the other side. So the two ridges fit right here on the top and you can see it helps you to um, basically cut out a hole that is is going to be you know perfectly flush with the case and the right distance and normally I put it right over here the reason why is that over here there's a whole bunch of posts and it's kind of you know difficult to to center the other reason too is that we're going to be adding in a pallet switch so there's plenty of room on this side for that here so I try to put it like right about here or so um, hopefully not too close to this post over here on the back so just be mindful of that when you're lining this thing up. So once it's lined up, um, I'll tape it down and then I use a permanent ink marker just to outline the edges here. And uh, that gives me the area that I need to start drilling. And so that's something I'm just gonna do off camera because it's kind of time consuming and messy um, and should be pretty easy for anybody to do. But, but I just wanted to show you how the jig works. And so I just kind of set this up, mark out the outline of the hole I need to open up and, and then get started with drilling. So we'll be back in a second and I'll have this thing ready to go.
Okay, so after some careful sanding and filing, we've got these openings now. This takes a lot of time, as you could probably tell from the video, and honestly, I really hate that I have to make such a gigantic hole in the shell, but there's really no other way. And once it all gets put together, it looks very nice. So as you can see here, the 3D printed part fits very nicely, and it looks like it's always been there. The pallet switch is gonna go right here, and which is gonna come in and then get bolted down with the existing nuts and washers. And uh, so, yeah, we're basically all set. The only other thing I'm gonna recommend when you're making this opening here is just that if it's a little bit larger and this fits too easily, it's still fine because this lip is gonna hide the cuts that you made. The most critical thing really is just to have this all level relative to the shell. So you just have to keep a careful eye. And I was using a, a razor blade to start the process. And then I finished with a file to make it all nice and straight. All right, so now that this is done, we're gonna do the final step, which is to wire the pallet switch and the Super Nintendo Multi out right here to the NES RGB. Okay, so I've built two wiring harnesses off camera, one for the Super Nintendo Multi out and another one here for the pallet switch. So the pallet switch is easy. You have uh, three wires that are about like maybe 14 inches in length and uh, they're soldered to each of the three legs of the pallet switch right here. And I just put that in and screwed it into place and that's ready to go. For the Super Nintendo Multi out, I'm gonna put a link in the description for a photograph of what each of these pads corresponds to so that you can do that if you're following along. Um, but I'm gonna briefly talk about it on camera here. So back here, this is the color red, green, blue, and sync. Um, the red pad is square, so that also tells you the orientation of this PCB. These two pads right here are tied together, and this is ground. Um, I've got five volts here. This yellow wire right here is composite video. And I put that in uh, in case someone wants to use composite video or certainly if they're using this with HD retrovision cables because you have to have that composite video line. That's where sync is derived. Um, and then these last two vias right here, this is sound. And so um, the, Super, the, the, the NES only outputs mono sound. And so what I'm doing is, is I'm simply sending the mono sound to the left channel and the right channel. Uh, that way when you put it on your television, you get sound out of both speakers and not just one. Okay. So now that that's done, we're just gonna thread this through. And then the kit comes with this nice little retaining clip, which holds everything in place. It does a very good job of that. Okay, so that's not going anywhere. You can see I have a few millimeters of clearance with this post, so I don't have to mess with that either. All right. Now you just add this final screw here, and this locks everything into position. Okay, great, that's all set. So now, the last thing we've gotta do is just wire these guys up to their respective pads over here, and you can see that I've already pre-tinned them. And normally I find that this length, more or less, should be enough. I think this is about, I don't know, I wanna say like about 10 or so inches. Um, and this allows you to rotate the board and put it back into its correct spot. These I normally leave rather long, uh, just because this ends up being over here on the far end, so you definitely need slack for the pallet switch. But I'll go over that in a moment. First thing, let's just solder in the multi out. All right, so the last thing we've got to do is just wire in the pallet switch. And uh, just for those of you who don't care about the pallet switch, if you want to use the NES RGB and not install a pallet switch, all you have to do is bridge this little pad here for number three to ground and you're good to go. Um, personally, I mean, I do have them installed on my personal ones and I do occasionally switch them, but honestly, I kind of just set it to one thing and then I kind of forget it. Um, and I think a lot of people are that way, um, but not everybody, of course, and it is nice to have options. So, to install this thing, you've gotta take the center pin of the switch, um, in this case, I have it colored as black, and you're gonna use that to bridge these two pads together and just get it connected to both, 
just like that. And now the other two are arbitrary. We can put them any side that we wish. So I am just going to put that right here. And that is it. We are done with this installation. So now I'm going to go ahead and reassemble everything and, uh, and I'm going to test it. Um, the only other thing I'm going to do, and you'll see me do this on camera, is I do like to take a bit of zip tie and wire this little, or connect this little harness together. It just gives this a little bit more integrity and helps keep all the, the wires where they're supposed to be. Sometimes I do it for the pallet switch as well, but it's not as big of a deal because we're only talking about three wires over here. All right, so let's put this thing together. All right, so we're ready to do a test of RGB, and you can see I've got the NES sitting right there, partially assembled. That's good enough for what we need over here. And I'm going to use my EverDrive because it allows me to just very easily test normal audio and expansion audio uh, with just a few quick clicks. All right, let's go ahead and start it up. Nice. All right, so that's looking good. Let me pick Castlevania 3, the Japanese version, and so we can hear the expansion audio first. This game is so good, and sounds perfect. Alright, I'm going to check the palette switch really quickly. Well, i got to wait for something on screen first, I guess. Yep, that looks like it's working. And now let me just check some regular game, like Ninja Gaiden. And that sounds great, too. All right, so looks like we've got a nice, successful NES RGB installation, and that's all we've got today for this video. If you guys like this kind of content, then consider subscribing to the channel because I have videos out normally every Friday. And then, of course, if you've got a console that you want repaired or modified, you can always reach me directly at my website, which is oneuprestorations.com. Okay, guys, thank you very much for watching, and I uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Bye.